as we kind of wrap up this month and prepare to transition for to kind of lecture studies for next month, our final final lecturer for today is Rachel Schneider. She has a PhD from Rice University in Religion. Uh, she is the as associate researcher for in the Religion and Public Life program at um, at Rice, and also the associate director for Project Curate, uh, which is. A wonderful program in uh, Houston that's really devoted to developing curricula for religious communities to deal with issues of race and racism. Um, and a lot of her work focuses <coughs> on trainings on whiteness as a means to kind of find space for conversation and come to some kind of uh, equity and justice. Uh, so, as we prepare to welcome her, I want us all to remember to want to get once again engaged in that exercise of turning the sound <laughs> off on our cell phones so that again we have this wonderful tool that we can share with the community. Please help me welcome Rachel Schneider. Thank you everyone. Let me make sure my cell phone is off as well. Okay, um, as um, Dr. Norton said, um, I'm coming to you all from Houston. Uh, I have one foot sort of in the academy. I have my PhD in religion. I uh, did my work um, and research on white progressive Christians in South Africa and how they were attempting to engage in racial inequality. I approach the topic from a social scientific uh, perspective, um, doing field research, and I also have one foot uh, in, I guess you would call it, the activist world. And so for the last couple years, I've been doing a lot of work, um, particularly around whiteness, but in relation to race and religion and whiteness, um, really thinking about how to get a handle on the ways that uh, Christianity, white supremacy, um, and racial injustice are kind of all sometimes entangled. So today, I am going to talk with you all about the power of whiteness. Um, I'm going to give more of a talk lecture, but I invite you during the Q&A to like, engage if you want to talk a little bit more about my activist work or any kind of like practitioner stuff. I'm happy to talk about that as well. So whiteness um, can be talked about in a variety of different ways. It can be a mode of self-identification. It can be a social category used to mark status differences and produce hierarchies. It can be a cultural marker used to designate individual and group norms. But my focus today primarily is going to be on how whiteness is used to produce hierarchies within a racialized and racist social system. So I want to say up front that one of the main characteristics of whiteness is that it tends to deflect sustained attention. White group dominance is generally seen by most white people as just the way things are, by nature or accident, rather than a product of institutional forces, actions, and ideologies, which can change and have changed over time. White group dominance is a problem because it is tied to the unjust suffering and exploitation of other human beings. So I want to thank Dr. Norton in particular for her leadership on this topic and presenting the seminar, but also for your engagement, um, because it is so complex and difficult sometimes to talk about race, but in particularly, it is difficult to talk about whiteness. And I believe, however, that our collective futures on this earth depend in part on dismantling the logics of white supremacy that cause so much destruction in our world. So I begin with the assumption that we have yet to arrive at a point where people of color who represent the global majority are able to fully define and pursue for themselves full and flourishing lives, free and unencumbered by racist and colonial hierarchies. Okay, so at the same time, I'm very interested in what happens to white power when it is challenged by those on the undersides of white supremacy. Do whites, um, do those who identify as white, uh, retreat into safe spaces and try to hold on to what privileges they can? Do they try to reckon with a racist past and work to make amends? For whites who embrace social change, is it possible 
to learn new ways of defining and knowing the self and others outside of whiteness? What kind of work, ethical, spiritual, social, and political, is required of white people to challenge the system of white supremacy we have been conditioned to accept and also invest in? What kind of work is required to achieve racial equity? And how do even the best efforts reinforce the status quo? So it's with these questions in mind today that I want to reflect with you on the dynamics of white supremacy, especially as they manifest in the United States and what, by, what might be needed to challenge um, and change these dynamics. As a scholar of religion, I believe the damage of white supremacy needs to be addressed in our churches, in our centers of theological education, and in our society at large. This work necessarily involves reflecting on the role of white people in maintaining violent systems of domination. This is important because all too often, white people unintentionally or intentionally resist movements for social change. White people tend to minimize the ways race functions as a form of power, ignoring the suffering and terror experienced by people of color due to systemic racism. And you read about some of that um, in the chapters that I assigned for today. So in 1976, Alan Bozak, a black South African theologian, wrote a book titled Farewell to Innocence. In it, he called for a Christian social ethics that could struggle against racism. He argued that Christians, especially white Christians, need to say farewell to innocence by facing the lived realities of rich and poor, white and black, oppressed and oppressors. At the time, South Africa was in the midst of apartheid, a brutal system designed to maintain the dominance of a white minority over a black majority and other racial groups. But a counter movement known as black consciousness had emerged and it was challenging the authority of the white apartheid state by calling blacks to claim their own power and dignity even while living amid white supremacy. Similar to the violent responses to the civil rights movement and more contemporarily the Black Lives Matter movement, activists faced imprisonment, torture, and police surveillance. Mindful of these human rights abuses as well as the overall violence of the system of apartheid, Bozak wrote, until now, the Christian church has chosen to move through history with a bland kind of innocence, hiding these painful truths behind a facade of myths and real or imagined anxieties. This is no longer possible. However, he acknowledged that many white people continued, despite the empirical evidence of suffering around them, to deny the human cost of white supremacy. The problem, he argues, is that in order to maintain the status quo, it is necessary for whites to believe and keep on believing they are innocent. They are innocent because they just happen to have the superior position in the world, or in some mysterious way, they have been placed in a position of leadership or guardianship over blacks by nature, by virtue of their superior culture or by God. This stance, which Bozak terms pseudo-innocence, is damaging because it blinds people so that you do not see the atrocities of the present. It paralyzes, in his words, and cunningly uses all the means at its disposal to cover up and rationalize sin. Moreover, the pseudo-innocence, according to Bozak, has another function. It effectively blocks off all awareness and therefore a sense of responsibility necessary to confront the other as a human being. This leads to an inability to repent, which in turn makes genuine reconciliation impossible. For Bozak, pseudo-innocence prevents white people from coming face to face with the forces of violence within, leading to a kind of demonic self-destruction, which leads in turn to deadly consequences for others. The avoidance and shielding of the self from discomforting racial truths is something that sociologist Robin DiAngelo has talked about in terms of white fragility, and I think you all have already talked a little bit about white fragility. White fragility for D'Angelo is the tendency of white people, to, and I'm one of them, I have to say, um, to avoid situations that would produce racial stress. She argues that even the slightest challenge uh, to white power, comfort, and security, whether real or imagined, leads to almost default responses of defensiveness, aggression, and withdrawal. And I would also argue that hyper-emotionalism is also one of the responses. Um, for D'Angelo, the counter, though, to white fragility is resilience. White people need to move beyond fear, guilt, and shame to sit with it, but then move through it 
when faced with racial discomfort without causing harm to other people and take responsibility for their role in social change. So in the United States and around the world, um, race, you know, as I said earlier, is incredibly complex, but we can think about it in a broad way as a social system designed uh, to maintain a hierarchy between those who are considered white and those considered non-white. Those who are seen as black um, are deemed inferior often and placed at the bottom of the hierarchy, while those identified as white or closer to whiteness are seen as superior and given more advantages. In the United States, the nation historically has been understood fundamentally as created by whites, belonging to whites, for the benefit of whites. By contrast, everyone else in the United States has been seen as a conditional guest, subject to the ruling whims and norms of the dominant group. Often the choices given by Anglo-Americans to other groups have been to subordinate, assimilate, vacate, or die. Uh, for this reason, American history is a history of indigenous genocide, the enslavement of African peoples, the exclusion and internment of Asians, and the forced expulsion of Mexican workers. Within this context, individuals from black and minority ethnic backgrounds, by virtue of their racial identity, have typically been positioned as outsiders, whereas white groups and identities have been given the full protection of the law and rights of citizenship. So the past 50 years, we've seen more Americans and many white Americans come in tune with ideas of diversity and multiculturalism. But the normative power of whiteness, I would argue, continues to structure our intimate and social lives. White people in North America live in a society that is still deeply separate and unequal by race, and white people benefit from that separation and inequality. Whites are the numerical majority, though this is changing, and they continue to be the culturally and economically dominant group. Further, within the intersectional web of oppression that we have here in the US, whiteness first determines how groups are positioned, even within subcategories like ethnicity, gender, sexuality, and class. So if you can just think about who the preferred faces are for marriage equality or the Me Too movement, for example. Moreover, the post-civil rights assertion that all are equal under the law continues to be challenged over and over again by constant empirical realities that show us that all are not equal under the law when it comes to race. In 2018, most white Americans expect safety in their own apartments or in their own neighborhoods. Most white Americans expect to be treated with respect by authorities and given the benefit of the doubt. People of color cannot assume the same. In particular, black, black citizens, regardless of class, are often in danger of having an encounter with police and in harassment, detention, or death. If people of color are arrested and brought to trial, they can expect to be in jail longer and receive harsher sentences than white people. This bifurcated reality illustrates what critical race philosopher Charles Mills calls the racial contract. The racial contract is a political, moral, and epistemological system that upholds the differential privileging of whites as a group with respect to non-whites as a group, allowing for the exploitation of their bodies, land, and resources, and the denial of socioeconomic opportunities. In effect, such a two-category system creates a nation-state rooted in white supremacy, where you divide people into two basic groups, white and non-white, human and subhuman. While the racial contract can appear in overt forms like colonialism, apartheid, and slavery, it also can appear in more covert post-racial and colorblind forms. So this is probably not going to be a surprise to you, but many white Americans today express group dominance not in terms of race, right, but in terms of defending Americanness making America great again with the implied message that those who have historically had power need to reassert their power.
By looking deeper into how America and American is discussed and who's positioned as a threat to the nation, so foreigners, immigrants, Muslims, black activists, it becomes clear that the nation itself for many, many, many Americans is still fundamentally understood as created by whites, belonging to whites for the benefit of whites. Thus, I think it's important that we look beyond individual rhetoric to consider what Hart calls the entire racialized deck. So today in the United States, we can see how these categories of white and non-white, human and subhuman, are constantly reinforced through um, a couple different forms of violence. So the first is official state violence, state-sanctioned violence. So we can think about brutal police killings of black, brown, and indigenous people. That is sanctioned by the state, and often the state protects those people. We can think of vigilante justice. So someone like uh, George Zimmerman and his murder of Trayvon Martin. And once again, then the state protects those people through legal systems, through our judiciary system. So it allows for vigilante justice in many ways that are resonant of how we used to have other forms of vigilante justice, like lynchings. This contract is also uh, enforced through daily aggressions where white people take it upon themselves to call the police or seek out higher authorities when their norms of comfort and order are challenged by the very presence of people of color. So, for example, this summer we saw several incidents where white university students and staff members called the police when encountering black students on their campuses. And these were two elite campuses, Yale and Smith. Two other noteworthy incidents uh, occurred right here in the Bay Area. Uh, a white woman called 911 on an African-American family enjoying a barbecue in an Oakland park. And a white woman threatened to call the police on an eight-year-old black girl selling water because the child didn't have a permit and the woman didn't like the noise. Uh, that was in San Francisco. These incidents are noteworthy because they exhibit perceived white entitlement to space, public space in particular, white willingness to use authority and the threat of violence even against children to secure their comfort, and ongoing internalized assumptions of white superiority and black criminality. So I would guess, and I think that both of these women would deny being racist, their responses demonstrate the extent to which they have internalized white supremacy to the point of reacting aggressively when they perceive a violation of their space. Even though it's public space, it's understood as their space. Yet when Barbecue Becky, as she became known, and Permit Patty were filmed <laughs> and rightfully challenged on their behavior, they devolved into tears. Um, you should Google it if you haven't. Um, Google barbecue Becky, and claimed to be the ones who were traumatically harassed rather than taking responsibility for the harm they caused. So this played on the wider social impulse to protect white women and the need to protect white women against threats of racial violence. And it also uh, shows white fragility par excellence. Uh, it deflects away from white supremacy and instead prioritizes white feelings and emotions. So I raise these incidents um, very mindful of collective trauma of white supremacy on people of color and mindful of the triggers uh, that can come with retelling for those in this room. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that and say that what I find so disturbing about all of these incidents is that they occur within a national context where the majority of white citizens operate in a framework that resists reading these as racial, resists reading them as an enactment of white supremacy in part because racism is still understood to be something that you have to overtly say or believe, uh, rather than something that uh, is a system of power and something that people react and feed into whether they're aware of it or not. And what's even more disturbing, I think, as Robin D'Angelo writes, is that the deeply held associations of black people with crime distort the reality and the actual danger of or the reality and the actual direction of danger that has historically existed between whites and blacks. So it's a strategic misdirection, which makes it difficult to confront the lived dangers posed to people of color when white people act out of their fragility. 
So I would say that the real danger in these situations was Barbecue Be Becky and Permit Patty. They're the real source of danger because they, you know, have injected now this element of uh, raising the authority, calling the authorities, um, which we know in this day and age really does have life and death implications. It's necessary then to recognize incidents of racial terror today when they occur and to question how white notions of order and safety perpetuate harm against people of color. The recent murder of a black man, uh, Betham Jean, Betham Jean in his own apartment by a white off-duty police officer in Dallas who claims to have mistaken his apartment for her own, illustrates how black people are not even safe in their own homes due to white perceptions of racial danger. So, I mean, thus far I've been talking about whiteness and race in the United States more broadly. I'm particularly concerned with how white Christians struggle to recognize the entanglement of Christianity and white supremacy in the United States. That history is really deep and really long, and I don't have time to go into it, but I do want to talk about uh, a theological way in which white supremacy manifests, sometimes unintentionally. So for many white Christians, a theological belief in spiritual equality all too easily coexists with everyday systems of racialized social inequality and acts of racial terror. Rather than shifting Christian thought and practice to actively confront and dismantle a culture of white supremacy, most white mainline and evangelical churches tend to adopt this stance of pseudo-innocence, which fails to take seriously and deeply confront and engage the particular pain and trauma experienced by people of color, um, both now and at the larger historical hands of white Western Christianity. The failure of white Christians to confront the role of Christianity in racial oppression makes sense in the broader framework of white fragility as it challenges the fundamental goodness of dominant forms of Christianity and exposes the ways that Christian traditions and theologies are all too human, shaped by the material and ideological interest of those in power. While the role of Christianity in systems like slavery is sometimes acknowledged, questions of responsibility, power, and trust in relation to communities of color right now have yet to be thoroughly taken up in most white-dominated religious and theological spaces. This leads to the kind of situation that Hart describes in his chapter uh, with powerful precision where a culture of like niceness can coexist with deeply dehumanizing and disturbing experiences that leave people of color isolated and quite frankly traumatized. Scholars of color, I'm like not really the only person or really new to this conversation. I, I'm new to this conversation. It's been happening for a long time. Scholars of color have long drawn connections between white Christianity in the US and systemic racism. A number of theologians have also sought to interrogate the impact of Christian theology on modern racial ideologies, probing the connection between Christian theological discourses, colonialism, and race. J. Cameron Carter, for example, argues that modernity broadly's racial imagination has its genesis in the theological problem of Christianity's quest to sever itself from its Jewish roots. So from the second century on, claims of Christian truth being superior to other ethno-religious knowledge undergirded a distinct sense of Christian superiority, which then over time became racialized. From the early period, modern period to the 20th century, processes of European expansion Conquest, domination, meant that the primary distinction between superior Christian and inferior religious other increasingly took on racial markers. So distinctions between Christian and pagan, Jew, Muslim, morphed into distinctions between civilized and barbarian, free and slave, white and non-white, eventually solidifying into a racialized hierarchy that has deeply informed Christian thought and practice for the last 500 years. So 500 years of history that we're really sitting with and dealing with. Paradoxically, most Protestant Christians during the modern colonial period theologically upheld a position that recognized the fundamental unity of humankind and the spiritual equality of all races. And on, on the surface, this would seem to be very anti-racist or have the potential to be anti-racist. It remains telling that early slaveholders didn't want to proselytize for fear that acceptance into the Christian moral community and beliefs in spiritual equality would lead enslaved peoples to expect same corresponding social freedoms. 
However, the dominant trend uh, has been to uh, affirm a common humanity or spiritual equality theologically and then uh, have that coexist and find elaborate ways to rationalize that coexisting with social inequality. So there's a deep need for people like you to engage in sustained, rigorous theological deconstructionism of white supremacy in its contemporary forms and its past forms in ways that center the experiences of people of color. There's a need for Christian leaders to reject the entwined legacy of Christianity and white supremacy in ways that account for these dynamics of power and the need for shifts in power relations. This work matters because white supremacy in America has often exercised God-like power. So if we think theologically, this is my attempt to think theologically, white supremacy functions as a form of white religion that elevates white people and white culture to the level of the divine and seeks to secure omnipotent power over others. In a Christian theological frame, this elevation could be considered demonic in that the godlike power of white supremacy viciously kills and destroys within and without. Its path leads away from human liberation and collective flourishing. The demonic power of white supremacy is the same power at work in patriarchy, heteronormativity, and classism, and each in turn are key tools deployed in the preservation of whiteness. So the same power feeds into these other systems, but all of these systems together also are in the service of white supremacy. Therefore, it remains the case that when the, those most impacted by white supremacy get free, all of us truly get free. I think the black feminists who are part of the Combi River Collective said it best. If black women were free, it would mean that everyone else would be free, since our freedom would necessitate the destruction of all systems of oppression. So that's why in my work, it's so important to focus on those who are most impacted by racial injustice and to start the work there and to start the work with their experiences because as those uh, experiences are uh, confronted, as injustice is redressed, that leads to all of uh, these other systems unraveling. No one is truly free without concrete shifts in our institutional structures and modes of relating to one another. Unfortunately, as Drew Hart powerfully narrates in his book, white religious spaces in particular are often the most damaging to people of color, in part because they are often full of well-intentioned white people who are incredibly ill-equipped to deal with the realities of race. He writes, most Christians tend to operate out of a naive and thin understanding of racism, which doesn't factor the depth and width of our racialized hierarchical society. Like Bozak, however, he believes that the only way for Christians to transform the world around us is to pull back the curtain on racial power dynamics and see them for the evil that they are. There are many reasons uh, that white people are ill-equipped to see racism, and I'm happy to talk about those, but the impact is the same. Within white-dominated spaces, people of color consistently experience actions and events that diminish their dignity, devalue their contributions, strip their individuality, question their expertise, and fundamentally communicate that they have no right to belong. On the other hand, white people consistently experience actions and events that enhance their dignity, value their contributions, reinforce their individuality, and fundamentally communicate a right to belong. The difference in these two forms of experience have life and death implications because they feed into this broader culture of white supremacy and more specifically anti-blackness, where black bodies are presumed guilty. White entitlement to power over certain bodies, institutions, and space is not simply problematic, it's dangerous. My own experiences have convinced me that it is especially important that liberals understand these dangers or progressives. Within this contemporary moment, I think it is so easy to gravitate towards things like the alt-right and what they're doing and what Trump's doing and what Trump supporters are doing, what evangelicals are doing, but we cannot afford to lose sight of the equally violent ways that white supremacy shows up in spaces that are often considered progressive. So I'm from Washington State. I spent six years living in Seattle. I went to university there. And one of the things that uh, I thought a lot about is how central it is to Seattle's West Coast urban identity to feel tolerant and cosmopolitan, especially in relation to the eastern part of the state and the American South. 
Yet, in addition to failing to reckon with a history of indigenous erasure, until the 1960s, Seattle had neighborhood covenants, and I, guess, I would guess that San Francisco had something similar, that restricted black, Jewish, and Asian habitation. Today, Seattle continues to be segregated and racially unequal. It has massive problems of gentrification and police violence where black and other ethnic minority communities are constantly pushed out of their homes and neighborhoods or surveilled because all of a sudden white people decide that their historic homes and communities make for desirable and affordable property. So while people in Seattle consistently pride themselves as being open and uh, tolerant, they feel perfectly comfortable walking into a trendy restaurant or bar and seeing it reflect a pale glow and not thinking about how that in itself is a product of inequity. The truth is that it's easier for people in Seattle to place a Black Lives Matter sign in their yard than it is for them to vote and share public space and private space in ways that show their commitment to valuing black lives. It is easier to wax poetically about ethnic food and cultural diversity than it is to refrain from calling the police with the slightest perception of danger, real or imagined. So I draw attention to Seattle not uh, to disparage a place that actually is really deeply shaped who I am, but rather to call attention to the fact that white supremacy exists and persists in places that um, have progressive ideals. In part, this happens because of the segregated, insulated ways that white people are, uh, that white people live, and how this divorces them from really encountering the lived realities of people of color, which ensures that the system keeps reproducing itself. And this is part of the problem of where we're at right now with white supremacy. The situation keeps reproducing itself regardless of personal belief or intent or values. But liberal spaces, I believe, can support the maintenance of white supremacy in ways that are just as dangerous for people of color as the KKK. And this fact deserves to be wrestled with and confronted. Whether politically liberal or conservative, most white people in the United States have a strong social and economic incentive to not see our role in systems of white domination. If race and white supremacy are out of sight and mind, we can continue to feel entitled to enjoy the benefits of whiteness, we can continue to feel entitled to have our own racial comfort and security prioritized against other groups without having to face the myriad of ways that racial violence manifests. Beyond things like gentrification and policing, Hart reminds us in his chapter of further ways that white people enact racial violence, particularly through the use of language. One example that he brings up is Paula Deen's use of the N-word. The pain that black people experience when racial epithets are used and then dismissed as not a big deal or needing to be taken into context stems from the fact that language has been a linguistic weapon deployed in, within a deeply embedded history of white supremacist terror. So language is part of the host of ways that white people enact this boundary between human and subhuman. That's why it's never appropriate to use that word, no matter the context, words matter, and at the same time, Far too often, white people immediately want to displace their collective shame of white supremacy onto convenient scapegoats. So Paula Deen, or Trump, or Trump supporters, without also questioning how we ourselves contribute to the racial violence by failing to really hold and deeply understand the history of these terms and how they take place within a wider context of things like lynching, vigilante justice, and police murders. So I want to conclude by talking a little bit about white responsibility in the larger struggle to give birth to a world beyond white supremacy in light of the fact that people of color have been doing this work for a very, very, very long time. As a progressive Christian, I take Alan Bozak seriously when he identifies the social and ethical imperative of white Christians needing to say farewell to innocence. As he puts it, the question is no longer whether whites are willing to do something for blacks, but whether whites are willing to identify with what the oppressed are doing to secure their own liberation, and whether whites are aiding their liberation in their own communities. It is imperative then that those of us who enjoy the advantages and benefits of whiteness, um, whether we have a white body or not, recognize that we do so on the basis of a social system that oppresses those perceived as non-white. White people in particular need to take responsibility for making repairs and working to imagine a different world, one where black and brown lives truly matter. We need to own and 
atone for our collective sins by choosing a different path. And we need to do this by critically engaging with white dominated spaces and seeking institutional change. And by receiving the wisdom and critiques of people of color as a gift, not a threat, which can lead to a more just and equitable world if we are truly willing to listen. So now I believe is not the, the time for tears. It is the time for stamina. If racism is a white problem, then it is unacceptable for people of color to constantly be facing real risks of invalidation and retaliation when they share their experiences of racism. It is time that these risks be redistributed and white people take on some of that risk of confronting white supremacy, which may cause tension and discomfort within white spaces, white families, white churches, within friend groups. White Christians especially need to develop what James Perkinson calls a white theology of responsibility, one which continually challenges internalized uh, white supremacy and white fragility, one that's committed to self-reflection and challenging white communities to support the thriving of people of color. This theology of responsibility will also be a prophetic theology that tells the truth about the damage of Christianity made in the image of powerful white Western masculinity. This theology will reject ideas of power over, expressed through violent dominance, while embracing a notion of shared, spirit-filled collective power built through networks of interdependence and care. Black consciousness activist Steve Biko had it right when he said that only once the power of white supremacy is destroyed is there potential for white and black defined broadly to forge a true humanity where pol power politics have no place. I want to acknowledge uh, pers personally that this work is incredibly challenging and incredibly difficult for lots of reasons. In 2013, I spent a year studying progressive white Christians who were attempting to engage with racial inequity and the racist past. What I discovered was though white Christians, uh, they, like though the white Christians I studied wanted to engage more deeply with race and were dissatisfied with the racial homogeneity of their churches and the insularity of their wider communities, they struggled with the difficulty and the stress of the long-term work of social change. That is, they rejected the overt de defensiveness and denial of their more conservative counterparts but they were still struggling uh, in more subtle ways to reject white supremacy, in part because the work of confronting racism requires a very high degree of tolerance for discomfort and willingness to live with complexity. The challenge facing my progressive white Christian interlocutors was learning through sustained and critical engagement with black people and black spaces to open themselves to the level of risk, vulnerability, and dissonance that people of color face daily when forced to navigate white spaces. They needed to develop resilience in the face of racial discomfort and complexity. This involved coming to terms with themselves, not as heroic saviors or benefactors, but in need of a fundamental lifelong reorientation in response to what Jennifer Harvey calls the moral crisis of being white. Allowing their spatial and relational imaginations to shift required acknowledging complicity in systems of racial oppression, but also willingness to embrace conceptions of power rooted in collective interdependent relationships rather than exploitive hierarchical forms of power. And I have to say that I'm on the same journey as my interlocutors. I fall prey to the same temptations, contradictions, tensions every day. I am committed in hope to the long-term work of racial change. Uh, currently, I work with a group, I think you also have it here in this area, Showing Up for Racial Justice Houston. We uh, focus specifically on white people and white communities around issues of white supremacy and racial justice. We have heard the call that white people need to be taking the responsibility to do the work in their own communities and can no longer rely, nor is it appropriate, to ask people of color to do that work. And Project Curate, an organization focused on intersectional justice and racial equity. And this latter organization is a little bit different. Um, you're going to hear from one of my colleagues, Cleve Tinsley, in a few weeks. Um, we focus on centering what we call the prophetic truth-telling of people of color, along with their wisdom and creativity. We believe that effective social change can only happen through deep, sustained engagement between white people and people of color that takes seriously issues of power and trust. So if I can get personal here, 
Let me also say that based on my own experiences, often liberal white Christians, while at times recognizing the lack of diversity in their churches or institutions, resist meaningful structural changes due to a deep internalized attachment to whiteness. This internalized attachment to white comfort and security keeps us from recognizing that a lack of diversity doesn't ju isn't just something that happened. It's a product of centuries of racial violence, which cannot simply be solved by adding a few uh, people into the mix of white dominated spaces. Undoing racial violence will mean fundamentally shifting power relations so that those most impacted by violence have a full seat at the table and have the power to reorganize the table in ways that consider their own needs for comfort, security, and well-being. Such a reordering may also mean, and probably will mean, that whites as a group take on increased risk and vulnerability, sacrificing some of their own ill-gotten comfort and financial gains for the sake of collective human flourishing. White South African sociologist Melissa Stain wrote, a white skin is not a skin that can be shed without losing some blood. Leaving aside the ultimate question of whether a white skin can ever be shed completely, I do believe that it is important to recognize uh, that dismantling white supremacy and facing white complicity and racial violence will be uncomfortable and painful. There's really no way around it because it involves facing and confronting and wrestling with the violence that, and the rationalizations for that violence that aren't just confined to the past but continue in the present. And we have to do that work uh, in order to live into an alternate future. At the same time, all is not pain. Our contemporary situation offers us profound opportunities to imagine and practice another world, one where the bodies, lives, experiences, and contributions of people of color are cherished. The end of apartheid, and this, I find this is my inspiration, it really only happened because courageous people across the racial spectrum were willing to imagine and begin to live into a world beyond apartheid, struggling daily against their racial conditioning at a time when the apparatuses of white violence were closing in. So at the time that it was darkest, they were committed to practicing and living into an alternative. The same can be really true for us. So to summarize, race is a tool. It's used to serve and maintain white group power. It's used uh, in different ways over different times, but it always works to keep this basic hierarchy in place. Often universalistic or colorblind public discourses, both religious and secular, work to draw attention away from the enduring power of whiteness. So in the US, we have secularized discourses of the equality of all under the law. Uh, within Christianity, we have theological discourses of spiritual equality under God. Both work to shield white subjects from confronting the heart of whiteness, beating around them, or confronting the full horrors of racial oppression. Racism is a white problem that impacts people of color in an existential way. Confronting it and working to do better and make things right necessitates white people taking responsibility for their role in maintaining white dominated spaces while also supporting the work of people of color as they seek justice. Bozak and other black activists of his era along with a few whites believed that their task was to destroy white innocence and show how everyday white supremacy runs counter to Christian principles of love and justice. So I want to conclude by pointing out that while I've been emphasizing white responsibility and complicity, people of color have and continue to lead the global struggle for human dignity and freedom. It is they who have disproportionately borne the damaging effects of white supremacy and the life and death risks of confronting historical structures created and maintained by white people. And this continues to be the case in 2018, as people of color continue to reckon with daily visible and violent expressions of white supremacy in our nation, ranging from Permit Patty to the re recent shooting of Betham Jean in Dallas. Um, it's ironic, the, um, the at black activists who uh, were protesting this police shooting have been in jail far longer than the white police officer who didn't even spend an entire day in jail, was in and out of the system in three hours. So thus I want to be clear that while advocating for a theology of white responsibility and risk, I'm not calling for white saviorism. Certainly I've been suggesting that there's a need for those of us who identify as white, progressive, and or Christian to acknowledge and redress atrocities for which we are complicit, but part of saying farewell to innocence involves deferring to the lead and wisdom of people of color to define what redress looks like. 
while also being conscious of not invading the spaces of people of color unless invited or overwhelming them with um, my own or those of us who are white, our guilt, questions, shame, or tears, which only serve to draw attention back to whiteness. There is a time and space for those things. Um, I'm happy to talk more about that. No city and no institution, no matter how liberal or conservative, remains untouched by deeply embedded patterns of white supremacy. Part of my own journey these past few years is refusing to sit comfortably on the sideline as a scholar without also recognizing that I have an active role to play, not just with my words, but with my actions. So those of us who are white and white identified, we have a lot to learn from the resiliency and struggle of communities of color, which can aid our own struggle against internalized white supremacy and the broader culture of white supremacy. It is through deep listening and critical dialogue with the experiences of people of color that I'm reminded again and again of why it is imperative to reject pseudo-innocence and fragility, but these relationships take time and a lot of care. In the meantime, there's plenty of work to be done in white communities. White people can join people of color in solidarity by orienting their lives in ways that demonstrate here and now that black and brown lives matter and challenging their institutions to become ones where people of color are no longer subjected and curtailed by the forces of white supremacy. Black queer activist Adrian Marie Brown writes in her recent book, Emergent Strategy, it is so important that we fight for the future. It is so important that we fight for the future, get in the game, get dirty, get experimental. We are in imagination battle. I believe that those of us in the contemporary academy and working within religious spaces are strategically positioned to lead this imagination battle, to experiment with new structures that practice the very future we hope to see. So again, I have to say that I admire the fact that you are committing this time to dig deeply into race and into these dynamics because we can't imagine something that is an alternative without first understanding the reality the choice between us is between contributing to a world terrorized by white supremacy or imagining and working for a world beyond white supremacy, a world where all communities flourish and all lives truly matter. And this is going to take courage and sacrifice, especially on the part of white people, no way around it. It will take uh, renegotiating our churches, our theological education and other spaces in ways that allow white power to be recentered so that something new can be birthed and historical injustice redressed. It is impossible to arrive at the beloved community that many of us long for without a radical repatterning of our world, which inevitably demands that whites demonstrate commitment over the long term to enduring and uh, to ending white supremacy through personal and institutional change. Um, it also demands that new bonds be built between white people and people of color on the basis of trust and solidarity. But I have to be honest and say that that isn't going to happen until uh, people like me and other white people take the initiative to already begin their own work and demonstrate their commitment, not just for a workshop, not just for uh, a season of time, not just when the topic feels hot, but uh, demonstrating long-term <laughs> commitment to deep and sustained structural change. So I thank you for that, and uh, I think I'll open it up to question and answers. Uh, if you all have questions, I'm happy to talk through anything that I said. Um, and also, we have a, some questions for you as well. Yes? Um, so if you could speak more and say more about when you mentioned in like primarily white churches, mm -hmm. the move towards diversity, but could you speak about the line between a white-led movement towards diversity and tokenism. Where's the, the line there of, oh, we want, we want a few people who look this way so we can be a diverse body, mm -hmm. or because as you were saying, if it's still primarily white-led space, mm -hmm. it's not equitable. So if you could right. elaborate on that a bit more. Yeah, so the litmus test, I mean, is really look at power. Look at who is in positions of authority, I mean, I think it's still very rare to see um, white people under the leadership and authority of people of color. So typically when white churches or white institutions, but white churches I'll speak to, have tried to diversify or embrace the idea of a multicultural or multi-ethnic church, um, it has always been this kind of addition model 
rather than starting with, well, what if white people were the addition <laughs> to a space that centered people of color? And what kind of discomfort and negotiations would then have to happen? So um, for me, that's really, um, that's really what the core of this work is is thinking about every layer and every structure, or every layer of every structure, and thinking about equity. And not just equity, but like there might be, need to be a time where because of the over-advantaging and over-privileging of white people and white populations, that there actually, it may feel, it's, it's not that it's uh, necessarily true, I hate, I hate to say it like that, but it may feel like a loss of power because we're so used to enjoying an overabundance of power. Um, so there, there will need to be some like real shaking up of things. So if it's not making people feel uncomfortable, I hate to say it like that, but if it's not making people feel uncomfortable, if it's not threatening people's fundamental sense of security and comfort, then it's probably not going deep enough in terms of white people. Yeah. My question is along those same lines. Um, Talking about, I mean, as a Presbyterian, you know, a lot of the churches, Presbyterian churches I've been to are the median age is 80 and yeah. they're dwindling. And um, I think of my own home church in San Diego, it's in a predominantly white neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So, like, we can talk about race, we can talk about their participation mm -hmm. in white supremacy. Um, they can feel bad about that. Um, we can talk about ways of integrating um, in our own lives, but when it talks about actually integrating the church, it's in an all white neighborhood. Right. Yep. So, like, to integrate the church, I mean, you would essentially, the congregation would have to move somewhere else. Yep. Or have activities. So, I am of the view that integration. At Integration is less important uh, than other issues, like what I just related. Like, I do think there's a, that there are ways that people naturally, and particularly when you think about black churches or um, churches that serve m ethnic minorities, like that, that has been and needed to be a safe space for a very long time in the context of the larger culture. And so, um, I, I'm sort of cautious when it comes to like a desire to all of a sudden say, okay, how can we add more people? What can we do? Um, there is a way, and you know, for those of us who are positioned within white churches, that's where our sphere of intervention can be. Um, and it's not necessarily um, ch uh, changing, or, or there's, you won't necessarily be able to change the dynamics of the neighborhood. But I think what you can do is still draw attention to the ways that everyone is living and breathing in this white bubble, essentially. And so norms that people take for granted as just natural, oh, everyone believes this way, everyone experiences um, things this way, I think can be questioned even within white spaces, whether or not a person of color is present. Um, but it's very hard to get out of like the liberal um, the liberal tendency to think like if we just educate ourselves, we can sort of sit comfortable in our neighborhoods, in our churches, and in our spaces. So we can educate ourselves. I mean, this, I'm talking about my own church here too. Like it's predominantly white. Um, it considers itself very liberal and progressive. Um, it thinks of itself as educated. It um, and yet, so the work that I'm talking about with Surge. The work that I do with Project Curate, which actually involves like maybe being part of a direct action or um, having sitting down for like long and sustained and conversations and engagement with communities of color, which takes a lot of time and investment and like care and trust building. Like no one in my church, like tr everyone in my church is fine with me doing that work. They can outsource it to me and they don't have to push themselves outside of their own like comfort zone of like their neighborhood and their churches. So for me, it's much more about how to push people out of the space rather than bring people in. Um, but I realize that the demographics are, it's a little bit different here in your context than it is in mine in Houston as well. So I think we're all trying to figure that one out. Yes. 
Um, in response to that, I also am in a Presbyterian church with predominantly ED range year old people. Um, and okay. as a fairly white passing person of color, mm -hmm. um, one of like probably three people of color in our church. Um, it's also in a very wealthy, um, very white neighborhood in, in Palo Alto. Um, like the house across the street was bought for $30 million. <laughs> I'm like totally shocked. But um, one of the things that I, in my short time there, I've been trying to do is push them outside <coughs> of the church and outside mm -hmm. of the mindset that if they write a check to an organization, mm -hmm. that's the help that they need to give. Mm -hmm. Or if they, um, like they paid their dues, I hear mm -hmm. that a lot in the language that they use, and trying to reframe the mindset of, um, it's, it's not about checking off the boxes of your like you know guilt or, mm -hmm. or um, reconciliation. Mm -hmm. It's it's about what does that then do for the other individuals. Mm -hmm. um, and so constantly trying to push them out from the church or, or push them out from the idea that the goal is to bring something to that space mm -hmm. or bring something to them, but rather we could be a really tiny church with twenty people, but if our goal is you know, every however often we do it to go out and ask another community, what is it that you need? Mm -hmm. How can we help? Mm -hmm. um, and the priority not being, how does that then help us as white people or help us feel better or help our community grow? It's That's not the goal. The goal is to help, whether it's making other um, spaces, other churches, or other organizations on the <coughs> like a safer place mm -hmm. or a more supported place. Mm -hmm. And that could be financially, but because it's a wealthy environment, that's often the first thing to go to. And I'm like, make that the last thing. Like, the most important thing is your time, mm -hmm. is to donate your time. Mm -hmm. um, and the most important thing is to um, donate your part mm -hmm. and not to be uh, just kind of like, I've done my part, I can I cannot go to the opera or something, okay. which happens. <laughs> um, so that's kind of, that was my approach to being in a really white space, being in a really privileged space yeah. and commuting into that space. I mean, from San Jose, that commute 30 miles to go to that church and um, it's it's an interesting dynamic I haven't been there too long um, to really like say you know the past five years I've worked on this but um, it's a it's kind of constant every single time every conversation is brought up um, and kind of reframe and be just the repetitive tape recorder that just says that over and over again um, because it's kind of what we need. What do you find is the most challenging part of trying to get people to shift and put themselves out there? Um, In my experience, the most challenging part with that has been um, their belief that they're doing the right thing. Yeah. They, they believe that uh, when they read something, I mean, they're so conditioned into their, the church has a very um, strong history for being very progressive very liberal and some of these people have been there 50 60 years and they have this strong belief that they are not the problem right that they are they have been doing all the things that the beginning say yeah and I look at it and I'm like oh I think of that individual who thinks that when I read this right I think about how you gaslight people and how right. as a male person in this space you take in I've seen I've seen very strong progressive independent um, let's say women in that space back down because they were told to by men in that space mm -hmm. because they were gaslighted because they're so conditioned for decades to be around those people in that way mm -hmm. that they don't even think twice about how they're being treated in that space. If somebody were to do it right outside the door, no way that that would fly with them. But because it's that individual and because it's um, that kind of repetitive behavior, they're so conditioned to it, they don't even see it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of my biggest fear is that they there's so much that I'm observing that they're not recognizing that they're not they have the like you were saying the difficulty of admitting it's a part of yourself um that is that is something that you also are a culprit of right and never being sat like this work really is lifelong and long term so i mean 500 years 600 years i mean it's not it's not it didn't begin it doesn't end with us um, but I think you had a lot of uh, wisdom in what you were talking about in terms of not really being about, because when people, when it's about people coming here, oh, let me ask 
Dr. Norton to come teach me um, in my church. Um, it's really, even that is like white people control the space, they control the terms of the argument, they control what questions get asked, they control how people feel comfortable showing up. It's rarely a situation where um, it's actually the white congregants who are gonna have that feeling of being out of control um, or not being able to control the space and that's what I think has to get disrupted in order to make change. Well, we actually yeah, yeah, yeah. to this particular question. Yeah. I think the answer really encompasses walking or cultivating prophetic imagination. If you will ask okay, us say that again. In prophetic imagination prior to implementation. So we're all in dreams. And there's some fundamental things that we all naturally like. We like ice cream, we like to dance, we like to sing, we like plays, we like skits. So when you do this whole phenomenon of integration of will, I would, I would encourage churches to consider creating an event. Maybe someone so can, can write a play in the church and you go and you recruit people from all over and you provide a means to get them as far out to come and be a part of the session of plays and then you invite the parents and the families to come and bear witness to what was created in the church setting to for everyone to come together as human beings who have all participated in this particular activity for a particular objective or have a carnival of, of some sort with certain activities. So it's not like, of course, if you're far out and you're in this community that's isolated, you're not gonna have that presence. But if you start getting out and orchestrating activities that human beings can appreciate, you can generate that presence that will help you to discern our commonalities. And someone may be compelled to want to come as they become exposed to you in a more comfortable setting. Um, that can help them to come in and begin to address the tensions that naturally um, exist in this particular manner. Well, I definitely agree with you that prophetic imagination is absolutely important. Uh, we have to imagine uh, worlds beyond the power dynamics that we have in this world uh, and practice that even while we address the realities that we have in the present. Do you We're want to take this one okay. last question and then we need to transition? Oh, hi. I, um, I love the way you reframed the whole issue, and when you stated um, it's a white prop, it's a white problem. You know, I think that really, to me, says it all. You know, because just to give you an example, um, I, I went to U.S. South Florida Progressive City, you know, in San Francisco, and the first psychology class I took, the professor, a white woman, woman from Harvard said that white people were more intelligent, more capable, more wealthy, more attractive, you know? And so it's that belief, whether or not people of color in the room or anything, that, that a person can work on, it's a moral issue. Are you more entitled? Are you superior to other people? You know, and to work on that. Mm -hmm. And I guess that everybody has elements of that, even people of color, but it's a, it's a, it's a human moral issue, I feel. Mm -hmm. I have a lot to say, but I don't have time on internalized white supremacy. But I would just say, like, that is absolutely true. I think that fundamentally, I absolutely have been conditioned and internalized to accept white supremacy, and I can go into my background about it. But one of the things that I think it shows up for me and that I've had to really come to terms with is absolutely white people should struggle. They shouldn't feel entitled to a job, to education, to a certain way of life, to a certain quality of life. And I know that that's really difficult to accept in some ways. But when that sense of entitlement to those things shows up in me, that's when I really have to check myself because it has to do with beliefs that I absorbed about what I was entitled to um, in relation to other people. And so I absolutely think that we have to be on guard and confront when those messages of white, internalized white supremacy and internalized inferiority uh, manifest themselves. So thank you for your comments.